Welcome to the Mission 43 podcast. I'm Brian Von Herbulis, the director of Mission 43, and I can't tell you how excited I am about today's guest. Today's guest is a Gold Star family member, co-author of the book, The Knock at the Door, and the president of the national nonprofit that is having such a tremendous impact across our country, the Travis Mannion Foundation. Welcome, Ryan Mannion, to the podcast. Thanks for having me. Excited to be here. Yeah, we've, uh, we've met in Dallas one time uh, at the George Bush Institute, and I know it was in passing, but uh, I've always been really impressed by your organization. Um, I know the organization was started by your mother, uh, and then you fell into that role. And I want to get into all that and all the great work you guys do around the country. Um, but I want to just kind of set some context um, about your story, uh, your brother. You know, your brother and I served in the same unit in the Marine Corps, albeit at different times. But uh, your brother's presence was there when I came back for a, for a second time around at 1st Recon Battalion. Um, and I started, uh, when I came back to the unit in 2012, um, started to really understand what had transpired uh, over, you know, the, these decades of war and loss and whose legacy was still present. And your brother's legacy was certainly present when I came back around in 2012, uh, back to 1st Recon Battalion. So uh, I want to get into a little bit of that story uh, and really focus on the great work the Travis Manion Foundation is doing now across the country and, and what you all are doing. I want to make sure that people listening to this understand your programs, the direction you're going, and how you've responded to the situation we find ourselves in today. So um, if you would, um, just kind of give us a little context. You, you grew up in a military home, right? I did. So my dad is a retired colonel in the Marine Corps. He did 11 years active duty and 19 years reserve. And so I was born in Camp Lejeune, um, lived in a bunch of different places. I think my favorite being Monterey when he was doing Naval Postgraduate School. Um, spent a lot of time in the D.C. area because he was stationed at the Pentagon. And then when he retired, well, when he left active duty, um, he took a job with Johnson & Johnson. And so we ended up in Bucks County, which is um, about 15 miles north of Philadelphia, and um, so this is kind of the place that I call home. Um, but, you know, growing up in a military family, it's, it's interesting because I talk a lot about it now. Growing up, I didn't really fully understand um, what that meant. And now uh, I, I understand that there, there were different things that I experienced as a kid growing up. Um, the, I've got three kids myself and they've grown up in the same house and had the same friends and the same experiences for their entire life. And, you know, I'm, I often talk to them about this idea that when I was their age, I moved every two years. And I think I learned a lot about adversity and, you know, challenging situations because as a kid, like that wasn't easy. Um, it wasn't easy to be the new kid every 18 months. And so for that, uh, my brother and I were actually only 15 months apart. We were Irish twins and both born in Camp Lejeune. And we had a really close bond, uh, not only because of our closeness in age, but because, you know, moving around as kids, Travis was that one person that was always going to be there. And um, that really was, I think, a lot of what bonded us so much as kids and as we grew into teenagers and adults um, you know, he was my best friend and he was the person that I looked to for guidance and advice. And I would say vice versa, you know, he was, I was the first person he came to. Um, so his loss, um, you know, it definitely, it was, it was, and will be the hardest thing I've ever dealt with in my life. Yeah. I, um, I kind of share that from perhaps your dad's perspective. So I, you know, had a, a lengthy career in the Marine Corps and 
I have a daughter and a son who's a couple years younger than my daughter. Um, so they, they grew up in a similar fashion, right? They, they moved around a little bit. They had each other and still have each other to lean on. But they have that perspective of what it's like growing up in a military household uh, and in today's world and over the last you know 20 years of conflict, they, they understood that dad kind of came and went a lot uh, and they didn't really know me as a person. Um, so they really had to lean on each other. Um, and it was very interesting. The day I retired out of First Recon Battalion, um, I watched this transformation come over my kids where they realized for the first time that they had their dad back. And it was, it was a really interesting phenomenon for me to watch this. My daughter breaking down in tears and my son is going, but wait, dad's not a Marine anymore. Like life is going to be so weird. Like we're, we're not going to see him in his uniform anymore. Uh, so for both of them, it was totally different. But military kids have this uh, unique ability, I think, to adapt, like you're saying, uh, to overcome. And they lean on each other and provide for each other and take care of each other. So um, what what was that dynamic like with Travis? You know, you were the older sibling, right? Yep. And you had this very focused, probably. I know Travis was a big athlete. Um, very driven individual, like most of the, the Marines I encountered at, at first recon battalion, they're, they're all very similar in their persona, super driven type a guys that only get to those types of units by being that way. Um, how, how was that dynamic growing up with, with a brother like that? And, and what was your persona like, you know, as a, as a teenager, um, growing up with a, a younger brother who was super driven in his athletic adventures? So I actually talk a lot about this in my book. Um, my persona was very different than my brother's. Um, I was a bit of a rebellion. Um, you know, I was the, the girl that my parents sent to Catholic high school and I lasted one year. And um, the girl that was always looking for what party was happening on Friday and Saturday night. And I talk a lot in my book about, um, I think to some degree, Travis kind of envied my lightheartedness and attitude towards, you know, responsibility. And on the flip side, I was always incredibly in awe of his drive. So you look at a kid who, um, Travis was an all American wrestler in high school, went on to wrestle at the Naval Academy and my brother entered into his freshman year of high school. He wrestled 145, 145 pounds, um, was an All-American that year. Um, and then he went through this transformation that the following year, his sophomore year, he was 184. So he went from wrestling 145 to 184 in one year. Wow. And that didn't happen just by a growth spurt. That happened because Travis was downstairs on an old dirty weight bench in an unfinished basement lifting every day and, you know, running gassers outside the house. And um, one of the things I talk about in my book is, you know, while Travis was doing that, we had this, we had an unfinished part of our basement and a finished part and had two couches and a TV. And Travis, no matter what day it was, he was working out and, Every Friday and Saturday night, we would join up on those couches and we'd sleep on those couches, adjoining couches every Friday and Saturday night. And he kind of lived through my livelihood. So I'd come home and he'd be like, so what happened? What, what went on tonight? What were you doing? And, and there were a couple times where I brought him out with me and he saved me from some um, precarious situations, being the good brother that he is. But I was never... Um, envious of kind of the limelight that was put on him and there certainly was but he deserved all of that and more um I was just this adoring older sister that was like look at my brother I mean look at everything he's doing so just so incredibly proud of him and that wasn't that's not something that started when he 
went to the Naval Academy and joined the Marine Corps. I mean, I had those same feelings for him when he was 13, 14, 15 years old. But you, you were an athlete yourself, right? I mean, let's not cut you short by any means. I was, I was, I, I, um, uh, and you know, my dad talks about it a lot. My dad always used to say like, Ryan, you were actually the one with the God given athletic ability. So I took that God-given athletic ability, and I played lacrosse through high school, got a scholarship to college, played Division Three lacrosse in college, um, actually broke some NCAA records for Division Three in scoring, but I didn't do anything with it. I, I didn't, I mean, ima- I, I think back now and I imagine what, if I had actually applied myself, and he said, you know, Travis wasn't born as an athlete. He wasn't born that way. I mean, when my brother was... 10 years old, he used to play on a CYO football team and he was this chubby little kid and his nickname was pork chop. (laughs) And, you know, when he was wrestling as a young kid, my dad said, I think it it was probably a hundred matches. We watched him wrestle and get his butt kicked before he ever won a match. So you think of a person like that, that just did not give up Uh, each and every day. He set his sights on, okay, this is where I am now. This is where I want to be. Um, it was fascinating to watch for sure. So when Travis decided to join the Marine Corps, that was no shock to you, was it? No, I would have been extremely surprised if he had chose to, you know, he was at the Naval Academy, so he either had to go Navy or Marine Corps, but right. had he, had he chose the, the Navy path, I, I think we all would have been incredibly shocked. But, but again, my dad always said, you know, even from the idea of him going to the Naval Academy to what path he chose in the military outside of that, it was never something that was driven into him. That was those were decisions and choices that he made on his own 100 percent. So Travis went off uh, into the Marine Corps and you were uh, somewhat of an early entrepreneur, right? I was. We, I graduated from college, and um, I had sites on opening up small businesses. I wanted to set up a clothing boutique. I had um, taken out small business loans before I'd even graduated from college. Like wow. I knew exactly what I wanted to do, and, um, and I did that. And I opened up a, um, a store in New Jersey, um, and it was very successful, and I loved it. I miss it. Yeah. So again, I think, um, you know, Travis certainly driven in his goals and aspirations uh, through his athletic prowess and then joining the military and finding his way into some of the military's more elite units. Um, But you were also driven. I mean, that's not very common for a young college graduate to leap out into the world of entrepreneurship. I mean, that takes a tremendous amount of drive. So I would say just looking at that, from an early age, you were always a very driven person in your own way. In my own way. Yes. We'll, we'll leave it at that. In my own way. I was like when I, listen, when I, um, set my sights to something, I, I, I got it done. I made it happen, you know, but, um, but Travis set his sights for things that were much more admirable, I would say. So, okay. So, Uh, Travis deployed to Iraq, uh, and on his second tour in Iraq, he was assigned to a military transition team. That's right. Correct. Okay. So he was somewhat stripped away from first recon battalion assigned to this, uh, transition team, um, and was killed in action in April of 2007. So we're, we're actually coming up on the anniversary of that date. Um, so tell us a little bit about your understanding. What what happened? What was Travis doing? And uh, and what's your understanding of that situation? Sure. So Travis graduated in 2004. Um, he was in Iraq for his first deployment in 2005. And on that deployment, um, he was a logistics officer at the time. And so um, I remember if I emailed Travis, I would hear back with him from him like, almost immediately. I mean, he was sitting at a computer. Um, so at, um, from that perspective, my mom and I were incredibly happy that he was behind the wire sitting at a computer on the flip side. He's calling my dad complaining about this isn't what I want to be doing. You know, I'm, this is not what I want to be doing. Um, 
And so he came back from that deployment, and that's when he went into first recon. Um, he got attached to a MIT team and was deployed in 2006, the day after Christmas in 2006, December 26. And I remember leading up to that deployment, there was a lot of hushed conversations because, um, and I remember my dad actually saying to us, like, to my mom and I, like, listen, this deployment's going to be different. You know, there's, you're not going to be sending Travis and all his buddies care packages and Travis isn't going to email you back every day. Um, and so when he went on that deployment, we certainly knew that things were different. I think we got, we got three or four mass emails from him that he sent to a bunch of people. It was very standard format. This is, you know, this is what's going on. Um, I had a few conversations with him. They were all on, um, satellite phones breaking up. Um, but I remember the last time I talked to him. I was actually unboxing things from a new shipment for my store. And uh, I said, you know, you're almost, this was out a week before he died. And I said, I'm so excited. You're like almost, you're, you're halfway through. You'll be home soon. And he said, well, you know, we're going to take every, every day at a time. And that scared me. You know, I was like, well, what does that mean? I want him to say like, yep, I'll, I'll be home soon. But he kind of paused and said, you know, one day at a time, one day at a time. And, um, and he kept trying to change the conversation because I kept saying, well, what's going on over there? Because when I was talking to him on his first deployment, uh, he talked to me, they were, it was during the election. And so he was kind of running me through all the different things that were happening. And this deployment, anytime I try to talk to him about like, well, what's happening over there? He's like, ah, oh, don't worry about it. Like, do you have great, you know, do you have any good genes for men? Like kept trying to flip it back on, on, you know, talking about what was happening back at home. And so I got off of that phone call and, um, about a week later he was killed. It was April 29th, 2007. They were out on patrol. They were ambushed while out on patrol. And, um, during that ambush, um, a sniper, uh, hit one of his, uh, fellow Marines, Travis, uh, exposed himself to enemy fire and pulled him to safety. And then their medic, um, was hit as well. And Travis again, exposed himself to enemy fire to pull him back. And, um, you know, they were, according to his, uh, silver star citation, they were kind of covered on multiple positions. Travis exposed himself a final time with his grenade launcher and did push the enemy back. And at that time he was, um, shot and, um, and killed. And so, uh, that was a Sunday. Um, we received the news. Uh, I happened to be at my parents' house when um, they came to the door to share with my parents that he was killed. And we actually were having a barbecue with a bunch of family and friends. So we had about 30 people at the house when they came to our door. That, that's unbelievable. Um, so you're there celebrating with family, you know, having a big backyard barbecue when I assume a, a Marine officer shows up at the door to deliver the, the notification. Yes. A Marine officer who actually graduated from Navy with Travis and knew Travis. And, um, you know, I look back to some of the things, you know, my dad at the time, my dad was still in, my dad was a Colonel in the Marine Corps and, um, he was serving with a unit, uh, a mag unit out of new Orleans that was, um, run by one of his best friends who was a general at the time. And, he shares the story of how he got the notification that morning and, you know, he saw the casualty list and he saw Travis's name on the casualty list. And this is my dad's best friend who cannot pick up the phone to call my dad and tell him, you know, your son was killed and who grew up with my brother as well. And yeah. so they did, the Marine Corps did, um, find one of my dad's friends, a Lieutenant Colonel who lived in the area to escort the casualty officer um, at our house, which, um, I think, you know, it was, a, it was a good thing. And I appreciate that they did that as well, but yeah, it was, um, it was a moment that I certainly relive over and over in my head. Yeah, uh, undoubtedly. So, um, you know, I, th those moments are tremendously affecting, uh, to all those involved. So, 
Um, certainly the family, and I know that changed family dynamics forever. Um, and, you know, I, I look at that from a, a different lens. Um, I've been the notification officer two times uh, during my Marine Corps career. And the impact that has on the family and on the individual that has to deliver that news is just this unbelievable crushing blow to the soul. Um, so, you know, that knock at the door, you being on the receiving end, your family being on the receiving end, but um, that lens that I share with that casualty officer and so many others that have had to deliver that news uh, and knowing what type of message you're delivering, um, man, that weighs heavy on, on so many that have had to carry that burden. Um, so it's, it's so interesting to me to, to understand your story and to, to have been through that same process uh, and how it's affected all those involved. And, and we'll certainly get into that because I'm, I'm really interested in how you've transformed that, that grief and how your family transformed that grief into all the positive work you're doing now. But man, that's, that's some really hard stuff that I don't think most people in this country give credence to that whole situation. And I know your, your book covers a lot of that um, in the amount of grief that comes with that and, and then transforming that grief into purpose. Uh, and that's, that's kind of where your family went, right? You, you're grieving. Uh, and I think your, your mother spearheaded an effort, right? To pick herself up and to channel grief into positivity. And that was the beginnings of what is the Travis Mannion Foundation. Is that right? That's correct. And, you know, uh, I'll backtrack for a second when you talk about the notification officer. Um, one of my most vivid memories from that day is turning around and the notification officer again who graduated with Travis from Navy um his car was parked on the street and I turned around when I was walking back because we were people had kind of like come out I mean again there's 30 people so people are like coming out into the driveway nobody knows what to do it was like kind of sheer panic and I remember turning around and looking up at the road and I saw him and he was in his car and he was just leaning against the steering wheel with his hands covering his head. And I, I'll never forget that, that visual of him. And I, and for a second, I, I felt his pain and, and I knew how hard that was for him to have to deliver that news to my family. So I certainly, I feel so much for those that, that have to make that, make that knock and, and share that news. Um, yeah. So, you know, after my, my brother was killed, one of the first things that happened was, um, our family friends had set up a, in lieu of flowers, donate to the first Lieutenant Travis Manning Memorial Fund. And so we found ourselves, a few weeks after Travis's death with several hundred thousand dollars in a bank account. And we, we turned to ourselves collectively and said, well, you know, what, are, what are we doing here? And, and it was my mom who said, you know, I'm going to continue his mission and we're going to continue his legacy of service in some way. And so when the Travis Mannion foundation first began, she right away put in a five O for 501 C three status. She put a mission statement down and our first mission statement was insanely overarching, but it was to support our returning veterans, to support families of our fallen service members and to play a role in helping to create the next generation of leaders. And I remember being like, mm, that seems like a pretty broad mission, mom, but in full disclosure, the Travis Mannion Foundation in the beginning was to my dad, my husband, and myself, we saw that very much as a way for a mother to channel the grief of losing her son. None of us saw it as more than a small memorial fund where she could do good in her son's name here locally in the Philadelphia area. And so I would say for the first year, year and a half, we didn't really play uh, 
a very significant role in the Travis Mannion Foundation. It was kind of like, that's mom's thing. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and we saw that it, it was bringing her purpose. So we knew it was good, but, you know, we were all doing our own things. We weren't all like, oh, we're all in Travis Mannion Foundation. That was Janet Mannion's thing. Let her run with it. And it was probably about a year later where we're like, oh, she's, she's actually doing something here. And I look back on it now, but I think it speaks a lot to the idea of, of the military spouse. And you see a lot about the how there's so much spotlight put on military families and military spouses and and all they walk through. I mean, this was a woman who married at 22 years old to my dad and, you know, ended up just following him and his career throughout her entire life. She never had a career of her own. She was, you know, the assistant in a, in a classroom when we were in school. She was the assistant to a dental hygienist. You know, she was always picking up odd jobs here or there. But this was a woman who, after her son died, like found her purpose for what she wanted to do in her life. And, and we embraced that fully and said, okay, like she's doing something here. And, you know, I think it's time to like help her and, and push this forward. So, yeah, I, I would agree with your statement about the resilience of the military spouse. Uh, I don't think I've ever encountered resilience like that anywhere in our society where the military spouse willingly uh, goes along with this program and and certainly recently with you know protracted combat operations and multiple deployments for many of our service members uh, and raising families and uprooting them constantly uh, and dealing with the coming and going of that service member uh, for training and, and deployments. Uh, just a fascinating, hardened group of individuals that have so much to offer. Uh, our society, and in some cases, an untapped resource, uh, and and we can get into into some of that because I know they're embedded into into your organization. Yeah, absolutely. So your mom took her grieving process and and channeled it, and and you guys observed her for about a year as she put a tremendous amount of effort into new purpose in her life and and driving this new organization, and, and it really started to scale. Um, so at what point did you come on board uh, with the Travis Mannion Foundation? I joined the Travis Mannion Foundation in late 2009. Uh, I came on board. Actually, funny story, it was my mom at the time had one, well, she had two employees. She had like a bookkeeper, and then she had my best friend from high school, who she paid $10 an hour to, um, who was just her everything girl, did everything that, that, you know, they just worked together. And the office was my parents' kitchen table. And every morning, my best friend from high school would drive to my parents' house and set up her laptop at my parents' kitchen table. And so, like, that's how grassroots it was. Wow. And then my mom said, well, I want to hire a, I want to hire a, um, executive director. And at the time I had left, I had closed up my businesses. When Travis was killed, I actually had two stores. Um, at the time I had expanded to two locations. Um, it was gosh, within six months, I just no longer felt any purpose in selling designer clothing. It brought me nothing. And so I closed both of my businesses up and I decided that I wanted to do something I wanted to serve in some way. And I thought for me, I'm not going to join the military, but I'll, I'll take a job with the government. I thought taking a job with the government was, was really a great way to serve. Um, I took a job with HUD. So okay. I was working with, um, HUD. Um, it, it's not, I don't want to say it's not a great way to serve. It wasn't a great way for me to serve. Um, it wasn't, it didn't bring me what I was looking for. Um, but I was working for HUD and, um, and then my mom put out a call for an executive director and it was like, send your resumes to, uh, jobs at travismanion.com. And so I remember sitting in my office at work and I put together my resume <laughs> and I sent it in to the website. I sent it into info, didn't tell my mom or my dad 
And um, I say I say there wasn't a ton of nepotism involved, but I did get the job. I don't even know <laughs> if anybody else actually applied for the job, but I got the job. I joined her in 2000, late 2009, as the executive director. But, I mean, honestly, I was Janet Mannion's assistant. I was following and learning and growing from everything she was doing. And it was fascinating to watch how quickly – she learned the nonprofit world. She learned about the challenges that our, our service members and our returning veterans were facing. And she was very thoughtful. So originally, we were a grant-giving organization. We were giving out grants up to the tune of $250,000 at a time. And, and, but my mom was very thoughtful about how she was investing in programs. She was looking for organizations that were very innovative in their approach to how they were working with veterans and families of the fallen. And, um, and I'll say, you know, dive into a little bit of our character program and you look back at my mom's mission statement from the beginning it you know this broad stroke we're going to support veterans families of the fallen and play a role in helping to uh helping to create the next generation of leaders um at the time there were no initiatives around that third pillar of our mission and my mom kept saying like you know it was imp- it's important for us to figure out a way to take this third arm of our mission and do something with it because the person that Travis was on April 29th was because of the choices that he made when he was 10, 11, 12, 13 years old. And it was because of the incredible mentors that he had growing up. And so um, our character does matter program was, was born very organically. Um, I was asked to speak at Travis's high school. Um, they wanted me to come in, and this was in 2000 and, 2009, right, okay. right after I had joined the organization. And, and they had said, would you come in and give a talk to our student body? We want them to know Travis's story. And so I said, sure, no problem. I was actually very excited. It was the first time I was given the opportunity to speak publicly about my brother And so I put together a 45 minute speech and it was a speech. I couldn't, and I'd memorized the speech. I could not deviate a word or I would have lost my, you know, I could not ad lib or anything. It was like, this is my speech I'm giving. But as I was writing that speech, I kept it, you know, the guidance that was given to me was share, share who your brother was. And as I'm sitting there writing for, you know, and they said, you have an hour, share who your brother is. And I'm writing this speech And all I could hear in my head was my brother saying, like, stop talking about me, you know, like just (laughs) enough. And so I thought, you know, I think there's a broader message here about what the type of person Travis was. And so I shared some other stories within my speech about um, service members that Travis had served with, not just those that gave their life, but those that came home, too. And um And then I was also looking, I wanted to find like a story about leadership that I felt was um, applicable to kids and, and what leadership meant to them. And so I found the story of George Washington and how, you know, his greatest act of leadership is that he retired back to Mount Vernon and let others lead. And I, I thought, what a great way for a kid to understand that you don't need a title or a position to be a leader. And so I gave the 45 minute speech it was, I've never been so nervous for anything in my life. And I remember before I recited the speech to my dad, I was like, dad, this, you know, I want to share, let me know what you think. And I gave the speech and he said, Oh, I think it's great. I I love how you pulled in examples of other people. And he said, and gosh, that George Washington story about leadership, that's such a great leadership story. I'm like, okay, great. So I give the speech at the school. And afterwards the principal says to me, you know, this was such a great message. I feel like it transcends beyond the walls of just this high school. Do you mind if I pass it along to some other uh, principals uh, within the district? And I said, no, I I, I loved it. Like I, I felt an immediate high from being in front of those kids and not just talking to my, about my brother, but talking about our military community as a whole. And so I said to him, you know, listen, 
where you just get some feedback. This is the first time I've actually publicly spoken. Can you get some feedback about what they thought? And so he called me a few days later and he said, I got to tell you, like, everybody loved it. You know, there's not much negative to say about what you said. And he said, you know, the only thing that if I can give you any feedback, the only thing some of the kids mentioned is that they didn't love that George Washington story. <laughs> and so, you know, the one story that I was like, this is the one. And yeah, my right. dad was like, what a great story. <laughs> but it was this like huge wake up call for me that our our youth are looking for relevant and relatable models of what it means to lead and serve. And what better way than our men and women who are standing up in selfless service every day in our military. And so um, from there, I actually uh, went to down to the Naval Academy and I um, joined up with a um, colonel, Marine Corps colonel who worked at the Stockdale Institute for Leadership. And he helped me create uh, a brief on character wow. and what it means to live a life of service. And, and, you know, it was the fundamentals of four pillars. It was going to be tailored to a youth audience. And I was like, this is the third arm of our mission. But the third arm of our mission was me going out and giving this brief all around everywhere. Um, the, the response to the, the, program that I was delivering, I, I say program at the time, presentation, yeah. was was good. I, I found that I had a natural ability to speak publicly. I loved it. And um, so next thing you know, we had the entire Philadelphia school district that had asked us to go to every single one of their high school, middle schools, and for me to deliver this presentation. And so I found myself, this was in 2010, and it was October of 2010, and I had, like, 20 speeches in 30 days. I mean, it was crazy. Yeah, and wow. I was like, this is great. I love it. Well, I started to find myself with some conflict. And I'm like, what am I going to do? I've got two on the same day. I don't have enough time to get to them. So I picked up the phone, and I called one of Travis's buddies that lived in New Jersey, uh, who he served with in the Marine Corps and went to the Naval Academy with and wrestled with. And I was like, hey, would you do me a solid? I said, I've got this thing going at TMF where I'm giving this presentation on leadership. Can I send you over the PowerPoint? Would you be willing to go out and give this to me? It would really help me out. And he's like, sure, no problem. And so after he gave that presentation, and I said, you know, share your story too. Like, you know, fill in the blanks with your story. And he called me afterwards and he was like, that was awesome. Uh, kids are incredible. He's like, some of the questions they were asking me were so funny. And, and he said, I, I want more. He's like, I'll, I'll do any of these. And so that was the ticker where it was like, okay, this isn't just about Ryan Mannion going out and talking about her brother and others. Right. This is about veterans going out and sharing their stories with mm. our youth. Yep. And so um, that's how Character Does Matter, our flagship program at the foundation, was born. Um, there was no strategic vision behind it. It was very organic in how it came to be. But, you know, here we are today in 2020 with over 2000 trained mentors, veteran mentors who can go out and deliver character education. You know, we've worked with close to 400,000 kids across the country. That's and fantastic. we have a whole, yeah, a whole curriculum off of what it means to live a life of character. So um, it's, it's, I look back from the, to those early days and those days where my mom was just hustling at the kitchen table. And, and the reason we are, and I, and I tell my staff this a lot, like the reason we are where we are today is because of what was happening back in 2008. You know, sure. she, while she is no longer here, she passed in 2012 from cancer, but she set she set the sights on where we were going to be as an organization for sure that organic growth to me is is so fascinating and that to me is where the best programs i've seen developed come from you know almost by happenstance but but people find their purpose in those moments much like you much like travis's friend a military veteran that delivered that presentation on your behalf uh, and then it just starts to take a life and it gives so many people um, that purpose, that drive, that meaning that they're looking for. 
And what you provide the veteran is probably just as important as the messaging that they deliver to these kids in this character development curriculum that you're providing around the country. Because that to me is what most veterans miss. They miss a couple things uh, that I, I know you're well aware of, but they miss that identity they had while wearing the uniform. They miss their camaraderie that they had in, in the military. But most often what I hear is they miss their clear sense of purpose. And you are providing that purpose to these veterans and military spouses across the country with that program. So that, kudos to you and your organization and, and how that blossomed out of just this organic, raw presentation that you started delivering in, in the school system. That's such a fascinating story. Yeah, well, you think about that, and, and just side note, but of interest, that veteran that I called to ask to, he actually, he was still serving. He was still active duty at the time. But when I called him and he did that presentation and got hooked, he was one, he became, you know, he became the first trained veteran. Yeah. Um, he, he now serves as the COO of the Travis Vanden Foundation. So, I mean, he made it a life's mission for sure. But you know, you look at this idea that one in three kids grow up without a mentor in their life. And I look at myself and, you know, get again, getting back to growing up in a military family, like my brother and I were incredibly fortunate to not have incredible mentorship from our own father, but incredible mentorship from uh, those around us, the friends that he served with are still some of my mentors and I still look to them today for guidance. Um, but one in three kids have no sense of a, a mentor in their a positive mentor in their life. And then on the flip side, you have our men and women who are taking off the uniform, just like you said, they're lacking that sense of purpose. Uh, they're feeling disconnected from their communities. And I think that's another big thing that's of note, you know, they're coming back and they're acclimating back into who knows where they were serving, where they were stationed. That doesn't mean that's where they're ending up out of, out of uniform. Right. And they're coming back and they're trying to identify like, where, where do I fit in, in this community? And a lot of these veterans are mothers and fathers themselves. And what a great way for them to come back and say like, listen, you know, I'm going to share what service and leadership means. And I want to share it with the kids at my own kid's school. And I'm not sharing that in a way to indoctrinate your kids to join the military, but as a way to showcase that we can all be servant leaders in our own backyards, right? Whatever path of service you take, um, you know, you, you can take it in many different, many different forms. So yeah, I, I love that program so much. And, and last year, we injected that into our Mission 43 Leaders Fellowship Program. Um, we had Derek Abbey come in from TMF and, and deliver that curriculum to, again, try to impart the value of that program and get our Idaho military veterans out and spreading that, uh, that curriculum to the youth here in Idaho. So our plan is to continue that model uh, the curriculum is fantastic, and and if our if we can highlight the value of our veterans to youth, and have those values those veterans feel that sense of value in their lives by providing character education to youth and helping the kids out, maybe even helping parents out that are too busy in their own lives to to have these conversations about what it means to to be humble. And to apply these, you know, 24 character traits throughout their lives and how important it is to recognize them. Uh, it's certainly a model that, that we're going to continue to exercise here in Idaho. And, and I just I want to thank you and everybody that's been involved from TMF to to put that curriculum together and share that across the country because there's so much value there. Yeah, well, thank you for being a part of it and for bringing it to Idaho um, and you know, we've got a, we've got an incredible training and education team at the foundation and they work so hard to put together content that is relevant and, you know, applicable to our youth. Um, and I think, you know, I think also, um, outside of 
the youth and the veterans. It's also, it's, I'm going to use a very overused term right now, but we really feel like we're playing a significant role in bridging that civilian military divide. Sure. Um, and, and that's super important to us. It, it really is because, you know, I think there's a lot of stigmas on the military community and I think it's important to normalize what a veteran is, what a service member is. They're not, they're not all tough guys with big muscles that you know, stand on rocks with guns. They are normal people that live in your community. And, you know, my dad always said, when I was growing up, um, in the military was just part of daily life. Like my teachers were veterans. The butcher was a veteran. My baseball coach was a veteran. We live in a society today with less than 1% of the population serving. And there is 100% of disconnectedness of our military community. And I think it's important to that we all work together to play a role in bringing the civilian population together with our, our military community. Yeah, and I, I think no better time than now as the landscape is being reshaped uh, across our country. Um, I think there are so many opportunities to showcase the value our veterans bring in our, our small communities around the country. And it's efforts like yours and so many other great organizations out there that are that are helping to spread that that positive story about our veterans, our veteran, you know, and military families and and their value uh, to to the communities across the country. Um, I I want to talk a little bit about the book that you co-authored uh, with two gold star spouses, um, and both of whom are embedded within your organization, right? They are. Yep. Um, both spouses, uh, Amy Looney serves as the vice president of the Travis Manning foundation. And then Heather Kelly is our, uh, West, um, manager serves out in the West as our programs manager. So what, what inspired you to write this book that, that really discusses transforming grief across the board for all three of you into positivity and purpose in your lives? What, what was the inspiration? What brought you all together to write this? Really, um, the book came about um, through a interview that the three of us did on CBS Morning News. Uh, we were asked to kind of share our story about how we were three Gold Star family members that were leading a veteran nonprofit. And, and as we did that, we got so much response to that piece um, because we talked a lot about our journey through grief and how we had gotten to the place we were. And we actually had someone approach us and say, you know, I think this would be a great idea to put your, your story down in, in writing. And so we came together collectively. And one of the things that we committed to when we put this book together is we said, you know, in order for this book, to be successful and to also um, do the best job it can do in terms of educating those who read it is we have to let our guard down. We have to be very authentic in what we're saying. And we have to make sure that, you know, there's, there's a lot of ugly that comes from losing someone. And, you know, there are a lot more dark days than there are bright days. And so we wanted to kind of put those pieces down too, so people could see a lot of times, you know, where I am today, uh, you know, I'm a very external facing figure within the Travis Manning Foundation. Right. And, you know, I get a lot of like, wow, you're so strong. And oh my gosh, like I would never be able to deal with things the way you're dealing with things. And I wanted to kind of rip that facade down because I'm like, I, I'm always quick to say like, that's not true. Like, listen, I go home and, and I have nights where I'm uncontrollably crying still you know, 13, almost 13 years out. Like, it's not all pretty. And um, I, I just have a good way of hiding it publicly, I guess. Um, so, but we also wanted to show that there is a, for better lack of a word, a light at the end of the tunnel. There is a way forward. No matter what challenge you face in your life, like, there is a way to overcome it. And it's all about a lot of the mindset um, that you use uh, to move forward. And so... That was kind of the, the impotence of writing the book. And, and, you know, it was a very rewarding process for all three of us. 
Yeah, you share a lot about the grief you experienced, not only in the loss of your brother, Travis, the loss of your mother, um, and also Travis's friend, Brendan Looney. Um, so that's, in in a very short period of time, I mean, you tr you experienced a tremendous amount of grief in your own life and continued to channel that through very trying times um, and not all pretty, as you mentioned, and a lot of time um, just grieving over those losses. But what I heard you say once was that that grief enabled you to become the person you are today. Um, can you talk a little bit about channeling that grief into purpose and, and where you find yourself today and what you're involved in and, and how meaningful it is for you to continue to do what you're doing? Sure. Um, you know, it was, it was actually something that uh, my dad said to my mom, my dad, and myself. Uh, the day of Travis's funeral, he called us into my parents' bedroom and he said, you know, and I remember my dad standing there and he was in his dress blues that I hadn't seen him wear in, in years. I mean, he was still in the reserves, but you know, he wasn't wearing dress blues too, yeah. too much. And, and I was standing there and my dad said, you know, from this moment forward, we move forward living a life that is worthy of Travis's sacrifice. You know, we move forward making sure that every single day we make him proud. And listen, on that day at that time, I heard what my dad was saying, but it, it wasn't fully sinking in. Um, but it was something that I held on to and I still hold on to to this day. I recognize now Again, another thing I talk about in the book is when we did that CBS interview, I said to the reporter, I said, I feel incredibly blessed that I have the ability to do what I do every day through the Travis Manning Foundation. And she stopped me and she's like, blessed. That's an interesting word for someone that what they do every day is as a result of losing their, their sibling. And I was kind of embarrassed and I was like, well, no, no, I actually do feel blessed. Like I've been given this opportunity and, and I believe that there was a reason I was given this opportunity. And so, you know, I've looked at it that way, no matter what challenges life has thrown at me since April 29th, 2007, I've tried to approach them in a way that my dad shared with me on that day. You know, like I need to make sure that no matter the loss that I'm facing, that I'm living a life worthy of that sacrifice and that I am appreciative that I have this opportunity to make a difference and do something and not squander the days on earth that I have left. And, you know, it sounds a little, uh, I don't know. Um, it's, I'm not trying to be overly profound, but it's really how I feel. And sure. um, listen, are there moments where I, I slip up? Of course. But um, I have a, I have insight now that I didn't have before April 29th. I was a different person before my brother was killed. 100% um, a different person. And, and my only regret um, is that he isn't, on this earth to walk beside me as the person I am now. Yeah. I mean, tragic loss changes us. You know, I, I think about the number of guys who were lost in units that, that I was in, in the Marine Corps and etching their names in granite to me, uh, was very symbolic about, um, never, never letting them down. And I think so many of us uh, who served alongside folks that were lost, um, think back about that, like never let their sacrifice go uh, without meaning and apply that to your own life. Never let them down. Um, and channeling that into purpose is to me so important. And you've, you've done it well without, um, you know, it, it's not all positive, right? It's it's hard some days to get by and think about those tragic losses, but it's important to think that way. Like never 
forget their sacrifice, but always keep that at the forefront of who you are today and what you're going to be in the future. And I think you do that extremely well. Um, but it's, it's forever hard. Um, and I will never forget those moments. And I, I kick myself, um, sometimes when I'm feeling lazy or not really giving it a hundred percent effort in life or not being the best version of myself. And I think about some of those guys and how they would think of me right now. And I got to channel that in positive ways in my life. And, and it's, it's value, right? It's value that we can impart ourselves just by the legacy of who they were and how they'd want us to carry ourselves forward. So I, I respect so much that you recognize that in your own life uh, and channel that. You, Amy, and Heather all channel that in such positive ways in the work you're doing. And it's so commendable, um, certainly hard every single day. But you do it with grace and you give so much to these service members and their community. So uh, I can just say thanks for what you do. It's, it's simple reminders uh, just by understanding stories like yours, uh, Amy's and Heather's and so many others that really remind us what, what it's all about and the value we can have in our lives moving forward and never letting those who served alongside us down as we move on. So Ryan, I want to learn a little bit more about all of the various uh, programs and activities uh, at the Travis Manion Foundation and, and where you're going in the future. You know, the landscape is a little bit fuzzy right now. Um, so I know you, you all have done some creative things um, with character isn't canceled. I mean, what a great message that is. And you guys are having veterans deliver a message about character uh, virtually, but Talk a little bit more about your leadership program and some of the other things you do uh, throughout the year and then where you plan on taking the organization in the future. Sure. So, you know, the, the Travis Manning Foundation in, it, in its full essence is, essence is a, you know, our, our mission is to uh, empower veterans and families of the fallen to create the next generation of leaders and build stronger communities. And we do that in a ton of different ways. You know, our character does matter program certainly is our flagship initiative, but we have seminars to help build newly transitioning veterans with their desired strengths and passions outside of the military. Um, we do service expeditions with veterans and families of the fallen where we take them away for a week to serve uh, in communities all over the world. Um, and then we have our Operation Legacy, uh, which is two national weeks of service where we execute about 300 service projects across the country, bringing together thousands of individuals to, again, serve their communities. And then we've got our, our 9-11 Heroes Run, um, which is really... Um, Again, talk about grassroots, um, another grassroots effort that started out as a small 5K run in our hometown and has now grown to 95K runs across the world wow. where we bring out about 60,000 uh, participants to be a part of these 5Ks. And, you know, people will often ask, well, you must bring in all your money off your, your heroes runs. And I'm like, if anybody tells you that 5K runs are a good way to raise money, I will tell you they're crazy. Yeah. Um, it is so much not about raising money. It's more about making sure that we're galvanizing communities. And the idea that we're bringing out kids who, you know, to to them, 9-11 is, is like Pearl Harbor. You know, they, right. they weren't alive for it. They don't understand it. And so that we can make sure that every year we're putting together an event that puts emphasis on our military sacrifice, our first responder sacrifice and the sacrifices that were made on that day. Um, that's what the event is about for us. Yeah. You're giving and a then, history lesson. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And then, um, and then our Spartan leadership program, which is um, our most in-depth program for veterans where they'll go through a six month curriculum with both in-person and online modules to further develop their personal and professional um, leadership abilities. And so, you know, for us, we want to just make sure 
that we are constantly creating opportunities of engagement for our veterans so they can come together, but so they can also come together with our inspired civilians. You know, our organization is a little bit different from a traditional veteran serving organization. About 50% of our organization is made up from the civilian population. Wow. Because most of our programs outside of Character Does Matter and our, our Spartan Leadership Program, they're open to everyone. So, and, and that's, you know, getting back to that civ mill divide, like we want to make sure that it's not, we're not just putting veterans in a bucket together and saying, okay, we brought you all here. These are the opportunities we're going to give to you, but that they're not outside and bringing them out into the community. So that's super important for us. And, you know, when I look at what we're doing now and what our plans are as we move forward, it's just in the last, I would say, 12, 18 months that I feel as an organization, we've kind of found our niche. You know, when, when I look at the evolution of the Travis Mannion Foundation, there's been programs we've tried and tested and they have worked for a little bit and then they didn't work anymore. And, and there's been initiatives we tried and, you know, and that's how an organization grows. But where we are today there is nothing I change about what we're doing. I just want to grow it even more. And I always say, like, I want the Travis Manning Foundation to be a household name. Um, but my one, one thing to that, that that bothers me a little bit, it was probably about three years after we um, filed our 501c3 and were officially called the Travis Manning Foundation. And really, it started to kind of hit a peak where we're, we're pretty recognized. And my dad said to me, you know, I'm thinking, um, I'm thinking we should change the name of the Travis Manning foundation. And I'm like, well, what do you mean? He's like, well, I mean, I don't really think Travis would want, like, I didn't know it was going to get this big and now his name's (laughs) out there. And I'm like, dad, we're, we're in too deep, you know, like this is it. And so, you know, I always say the bigger and bigger that we grow and, and the more and more we do become a household name. Um, I hear that little voice in my head that I heard when Travis, when I was writing that speech for Travis, when I went to speak at his high school, that voice that was saying, stop talking about me. And, and I always would say, and, and I would say to him, if he was standing right here next to me, that, that his name represents this generation of men and women who have served and sacrificed. And, you know, it's so important, you know, to be able to put a face and a name to this generation is so important. And I always say, like, share Travis's story, but but go out and learn the stories of all of these men and women. Because Travis is not unique. Uh, There are so many incredible stories. If you read The Knock at the Door and you hear... Robert's story and Brendan's story. Uh, they're, they were they were cut from the same cloth. These are men and women who raised their right hand to serve this country, who had the same type of drive that Travis did, who never gave up. And I think if we're looking for examples of how we move forward, and especially today, look where we are today. I just I just put out an op ed yesterday, and the op ed was all about how we can look to our military community. To, as a source of resilience to overcome the things that we're feeling during this pandemic. And I truly believe that. Um, I am inspired every single day by what our men and women do and how much they sacrifice to give back. And as they come back, as they leave military service, as they continue to say, I still want to give back. You know, that, that, what better way for us to teach uh, what it means to live a life of service? Yeah. And, and your mantra, you know, if not me, then who? And you're challenging our veterans at the same time. And that's part of what you do that I love so much because it's easy to fall into that other trap that we see so often today, um, perhaps this victimhood. But, but you all don't stand for that. You're projecting them in such positive light and don't give them the space to fall into those trappings You project them forward always. You give them opportunity. Uh, You're projecting ways for them to to continue to develop in their own leadership. Uh, And that's what I I love so much about the work you all are doing. 
is always pushing the veteran as well to share their stories and to share the value in their local community. So uh, work well done and well received by so many across the country. And I commend you again and, and your team at the Travis Mannion Foundation. You've built an incredible model for so many others. You know, we at Mission 43 uh, really look to you all and watch what you do and learn from you all the time. So uh, thanks for coming on today. Thanks for the work you're doing. I can't wait to see where you take this and how you become that household name across the country. Thank you so much. It was it was awesome to talk to you. Really great conversation. And uh, I'm looking forward to doing more with you guys in the future. Yeah, let's co let's continue to collaborate and, and continue to share. And again, thanks so much. And, and uh, look forward to talking with you soon, Ryan. Thanks. I want to thank everyone for tuning in to uh, this episode of the Mission 43 podcast. Uh, Ryan Mannion certainly sets an example for so many of us to follow channeling grief in her life with the loss of her brother, loss of good friends, loss of her mother, into the tremendous work that she and the Travis Mannion Foundation are doing uh, in really providing purpose to military veterans as they deliver the message of character to youth around the country. But she's also challenging veterans every day to make more of themselves post-military service and service in our own communities in the multitude of ways that we can inject ourselves. So I hope everyone takes uh, time to, to think about her messaging and how you can apply that in your own life. <laughs>